Hello, I am Dr. Jeevani Udupahilla, Senior Lecturer, Consultant Radiologist attached to the Department of Radiology, University of Peyrodin. So, I am going to discuss about the post-MD radiology program conducted by the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, University of Kala. What is radiology? Radiology is a medical specialty that uses medical imaging to diagnose disease and guide their treatment. Who is a radiologist? Radiologist is a medical doctor that specializes radiology in diagnosing and treating diseases using medical imaging procedures. Currently, we have general radiologists as well as subspecialty radiologists in the field. So, Radiology is a very interesting field. It's rapidly developing field in the healthcare system, and now it's an integral part of the entire medical field. So, how to become a radiologist? For that, we have to follow the postgraduate course conducted by the uh, Postgraduate Institute of Medicine attached to the University of Colombo. Finally, you can obtain the degree of MD radiology, and then you can become a board certified consultant or specialist in general radiology or if you choose a subspecialty you can become a subspecialist radiologist. The aim of our degree program is to produce competent radiologists capable of functioning as a specialist in the field of Currently we follow the prospector laid down by the board of study in postgraduate institute of medicine in 2015. What is your eligibility to become a postgraduate trainee in radiology? For that, you have to have a MBBS degree, local or uh, recognized by the SLMC. One year post internship work experience completed by the date of closure of the application. And then you have to sit for a selection examination on the merit order will be selected. So, selected number is predetermined by the Board of Study Radiology at PGIM each year after consultation of the Ministry of Health. So, then the in service training will commence. So, selection examination, it's an MCQ paper. It consists of two false type 40 MCQs, two hours duration. And it's based on the basic sciences like anatomy, physiology, pathology, and the clinical specialties, medicine, surgery, pediatrics, obstetrics, gynecology, and radiology. And it contains few statistics questions as well. So once you get enrolled into the training program, it's a six-stage program conducted over a five-year period. That is pre-MD three years and the post-MD two years period. That is stage one, that is pre-MD. After selecting from the selection examination, you will be in service, given an in-service training for one year period. And then at the one year or 12 months, at the end of 12 months, you are sitting for the MD radiology part one examination. If you successfully completed the part one examination, you go to the third stage, that is pre-MD training, training program, that is usually 24 months, that is two to three years, you call the second and third year radiology trainings. When you complete the stage three, then you have to sit for the MD radiology part two examination. When you qualify it or when you get through the part two examination, then post MD training pre period will begin. That is stage one. That is, you have to in stage five. That is, you have to do five, um, one year local training and one year overseas training. If you uh, choose subspeciality, it may be two years local training and one year overseas training. And after completion of everything, you have to sit for a one called pre board certification assessment. Prior to get your board certification as the specialist in radiologist, you have to sit for that. Once you completed everything successfully, you can become a board certified specialist radiologist. So the MD radiology part one, that is at the end of one year, first year, you are sitting for the part one exam that we assess the radiological anatomy. 
and the radiation physics and radiation protection and the radiological techniques. So currently we assist with the MCQ paper, essay paper, then there are some OSP examination and a, and viva examination. So but now currently the prospectus revisions are going on. So until new prospectus coming up, we are following the 2015 prospectus which consists of these sections in the exam. So in the radiology part 2, at the end of the third year, uh, then it contains, I mean, diagnostic imaging across the, all the clinical disciplines, all the pathologies, everything that you have learned during your training period will be assessed. So assessment consists of a MCQ papers, usually currently two papers, then the film packet reporting, that is, we call it a long case, you are given a, some uh, CT or MRI and uh, some additional images, uh, ultrasound or x-rays or whatever. And then you have to write a report on that and come to a diagnosis. Usually six to seven cases you have to do like that. And then the rapid reporting that is like a, you are given a, a 30 images, 30 films and then each one given a one minute like a very rapidly you have to say it's normal or abnormal if there's abnormal you have to say the abnormal it's a very short rapid reporting and then two viva parents that is the md radiology part exam part two so post md training once you qualify you can either you can become a general radiologist or you can become a subspecialty radiologist that is again there is a certain slots are available for subspecialty that is also changing every year after discussing with ministry of health we say we this year we are going to give interventional subspecialties two slots or pediatric subspecialty two slots like so depending on the requirement there will be number of general radiology slots number of subspecialty radiology slots so that is again on your merit order you can choose whatever you want. So currently the subspecialties we are having is uh, neuroradiology, pediatric radiology and the interventional radiology. So the post MD period the general radiologists they do one year local training and one year overseas training. Subspecialty uh, again one year general radiology training and one year subspecialty training and one year overseas training. So they, the subspecialist radiologists, they have all together three year post MD training pro, uh, training period. The general radiologists, they have two year post MD training period. So during the training period, you have to conduct research, audit, whatever it is in the prospectus, it is clearly mentioned. And you have to maintain portfolio to document the entire training experience, both local as well as overseas training. So who are the trainers and the training? Trainers are board certified radiologists, at least at least three years experience after board certification as a specialist radiology, serving in training units currently accredited by the board of study in radiology as suitable for MD training. So training units. The main training center is the National Hospital Sri Lanka and there are other accredited training centers by the Board of Study PGI. So the trainees will be continuously monitored by the supervisors as well as the Board of Study. So then you, are, you have to have a maintain log recordings, what you have done like log books, portfolios and then the periodic appraisals like uh, progress reports, peer rating, all these things are like a cycle going round the, during your training uh, period and you are closely monitored by the supervisors and the board of study for your So what is pre-board certification? After completion of everything prior to your board certification as a specialist in radiologist, you have another assessment board pre-board certification assessment. For that, the eligibility is you have to pass the MD training, MD radiology, and then satisfactory completion of local and overseas post-MD training. After completion of all your trainings, you are eligible for 
undergo pre-board certification assessment. It is um, summative done by two ways. Summative assessment of the portfolio that is you are maintained during all your training period and there will be two radiologists and a third examiner from the another discipline will be there to assess. And then the oral examination for that you have to present 10 to 15 minutes presentation about your training. And then the, uh, you have to, it, you should be able to answer the questions uh, will raise on your peer portfolio by the examiners. The, then the examiners will make an overall assessment of the portfolio with the particular emphasis of the sections of subject expertise, research, audit and formative learning. You are get through the pre board certification assessment, then you can go for the board certification assessment. Uh, for that, for board certification, you assess the whether you have got through the MD radiology examination properly and the, the satisfactory completion of one year local and overseas post MD training, either one year for uh, general radiologist or two years for sub specialized radiologist and satisfactory progress report from the local and overseas supervisors and then you have to pass the pre-board certification assessment and then you go for the board certification then uh, after viva like uh, you will have uh, some discussion in the board with the board members and then if the if you are satisfactory completed that then you can be you will be accepted as a board certified specialist radiologist future prospectors. So currently we are providing general radiologists and the subspecialty radiologists to work in the public sector, private sector, universities, military services or you can go for overseas jobs. So that is the summary of the postgraduate training program in radiology conducted by the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, University of Columbia. Thank you. Welcome to the fascinating world of forensic medicine and pathology. The program overview of forensic medicine offered by the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine. The spe specialists in forensic medicine in Sri Lanka provide their expertise and expert opinion both in criminal and civil investigations and court trials in an increasingly complicated world of crimes. The services include forensic pathology and clinical forensic medicine. The specialist should not only work impartially and independently, but also it should be seen by the society. The ability to work as a competent specialist in the field of forensic medicine is underpinned by the subject expertise, personal virtues, and professional qualities of honesty, integrity, accountability, as well as respect for good medical practice and human rights. Therefore, the specialist in forensic medicine needs to acquire expert knowledge in theory and competence in technical skills of the art of forensic medicine, as well as solid attitudes towards personal virtues, medical ethics, and human rights. The Doctor of Medicine course offered by the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, University of Colombo. The MD is the highest academic qualification, which is a prerequisite to undergo post MD senior registrar training, local and overseas, and obtain board certification as a specialist in forensic medicine and pathology. The board certified specialist in forensic medicine is the authority of the subject in the country. The eligibility criteria for the MD selection exam. The candidate must be a medical graduate who is fully registered with the Sri Lanka Medical Council. And the candidate shall obtain at least one year of work experience post internship, which is acceptable to the Board of Study in Forensic Medicine. Also, he or she should comply with all rules and regulations stipulated by the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine. Exclusively, the candidate shall not have past criminal offence convictions. 
the components of the selection exam. It includes MCQ and OSCE. And what other areas will be questioned during the exam? Anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, general pathology, histopathology, pharmacology, clinical knowledge with forensic relevance, and basic medical ethics. The pre-MD training program runs for 36 months full-time, which includes both training and assessment. The in-service training for MD in forensic medicine, each trainee shall be appointed to train two training centers accredited by the Board of Study in Forensic Medicine for 36 months. Out of this, a minimum of 12 months shall be spent by the trainee in a medical legal unit of Ministry of Health, and another minimum of 12 months should be spent in a Department of Forensic Medicine in a state university. The accredited training centers in Sri Lanka includes the Institute of Forensic Medicine and Toxicology, Colombo, the Departments of Forensic Medicine, Faculties of Medicine, Colombo, Pragama, Sri Jadalapura, Peradeniya, Parapitiya, Colombo South Teaching Hospital, Colombo North Teaching Hospital, Teaching Hospital Karapitiya, Teaching Hospital Kandy, Teaching Hospital Ratnapura, Teaching Hospital Anuradhapura, Teaching Hospital Jaffna, and Teaching Hospital Purunayagar. Also, the candidate can select an, a special interest area, such as in general forensic medicine, clinical forensic medicine, forensic toxicology, Forensic Pediatric Perinatal Pathology, Forensic Histopathology, Forensic Anthropology, Forensic Radiology, Forensic Cardiovascular Pathology, Forensic Neuropathology, and Forensic Molecular Pathology. The post-MD training program runs for two years, one year as a senior registrar and one year in overseas. The overseas training centers are located in United States of America, South Africa, United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, Portugal, France, Italy, Japan, and Switzerland. The career options available for a board certified consultant. He or she can work as a consultant JMO in the Ministry of Health. He can be posted as a senior lecturer professor, senior professor of a government university, can be posted as a United Nation, uh, Nation consultant, also can be posted as a World Health Organization consultant in forensic medicine, can work as an international criminal court consultant in forensic medicine, and also can work as an international humanitarian consultant in forensic medicine. As a board certified consultant, you will liaise with judges, lawyers, attorney general department, police officers, and coroners. The additional financial benefits received by a board certified consultant compared to other specialities. He or she will get an additional payment for each postmortem report and postmortem examinations. Depending upon coronial orders and magisterial orders, ranges from 2,000 to 3,000 rupees per autopsy, and payment for each medical legal report, 500 rupees per report, can claim traveling for, tra uh, for court visits, and also he or she is entitled for a driver allowance plus fuel allowance adding up to 100,000 rupees per month. Therefore, a board certified consultant, either in Ministry of Health or in university, draws the most highest salary compared to the other specialities. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I'm Suloshana Vijaytunga, a professor in pathology at the pathology department. Uh, medical faculty of Peradini University and also a, an honorary consultant pathologist at Teaching Hospital Peradini. So my task is to uh, explain to you why pathology may be a 
suitable career opportunity for you. First, we will see uh, under the pathology, uh, large pathology umbrella, uh, there are three MD streams uh, which are mutually exclusive. So there is histopathology, hematology, and chemical pathology. So I'm a histopathologist. So first we will see uh, what, is, uh, what is histopathology. Right. So uh, other than seeing unexpected uh, creatures under the microscope, maybe a, a dinosaur in a pap smear, or sometimes you might even see uh, Donald Trump. And so we will see why pathology uh, would be a, a suitable opportunity for you. Right. So I uh, uh, took views of uh, our my colleagues, pathologists, uh, very senior to junior pathologists, and to find out what are the positive aspects they see uh, in their career as pathologists. So the first thing that they all came up with is the work-life balance. Uh, so that is one of the very big advantages. Uh, we don't have night shifts and there are very few emergency situations. And now working schedules are very much flexible and therefore very less, much less work-related stress. But if you are an adrenal junkie, this may not be the most suitable uh, career opportunity for you. And then there's very high level of job satisfaction because we make a very, very important contribution to the patient care. At the end of the day, whatever the clinicians do, they have to wait for our diagnosis to uh, proceed. So without pathology, medicine is just a guess. So pathology is the king of clinical medicine. Right, and also it's no longer a uh, uh, laboratory confined uh, speciality. We have to have high level of clinical involvement, but that comes without having the stresses of pure clinical fields. And we have to have regular interactions with the clinicians and radiologists for us to get that uh, required clinical and radiological correlation. And then we will be able to give a clinically meaningful report. That is very important that our report has to be clinically meaningful. And we have to uh, uh, regularly participate in multidisciplinary meeting for patient care. And also, uh, after a lot of such interactions, we get a very good overall knowledge about the other specialties. And also, the we, we become very much uh, part of the, connected with the other uh, other clinicians and the the, the, the laboratory-based uh, uh, consultants. So we become a, a link uh, of a larger community. So in other advantages, there's a very high demand and very high job opportunities, both locally and internationally. And locally, both in Ministry of Health and University setup, because, because of this uh, high demand during the, the recent economic crisis, a lot of people in all three disciplines, histopathology, hematology, and chemical pathology, people migrated. Uh, so therefore, there are a lot of uh, uh, vacancies to be filled at the Ministry of Health and the the university set up. Even our department is struggling uh, with the migration of uh, specialists. And also there is a good private practice because uh, the surgeons, uh, gynecologists and other uh, clinicians, uh, whatever the samples they get, it has to be reported by a pathologist. And also there are many learning opportunities during the postgraduate period and also as consultants because we have regular uh, continued education programs, uh, workshops, webinars, seminars, and a lot of encouragement uh, to um, continuous learning uh, organized by the College of Pathologists as well as from the Board of Study of Pathology. And also there's high research opportunities. 
uh, if you are research oriented, then there are a lot of opportunities for you to have your own research, the, the, uh, the basic sciences as well as clinical uh, research. But if you are not interested in, not that interested in research, but still, e even uh, uh, passively, you can become a, a research partner in other research groups because uh, many clinicians will need your help, uh, your diagnosis for their uh, the, the, the researchers. And so you can become a co-author uh, by just doing your work. And also... If you if you focus on the scientific aspect of the pathology field, it could be highly intellectually stimulating. Uh, if you uh, still if you are not interested in the scientific part much, still you can become a reasonable pathologist. But by doing uh, by focusing on the scientific aspect, you can have that extra mile of your career, which is highly. Uh, satisfactory uh, will give you a high level of job satisfaction and also if you have and we all have uh, these uh, circumstances the difficult cases when we have difficult cases we have early uh, easy access to local uh, experts as well as uh, international experts with uh, because of the digital imaging technology so we all have that uh, local and international network of pathologists for this sort of uh, challenging cases. And also we have a very bonded local uh, pathology community, very friendly and helpful. And I consider that as a uh, asset and not many people uh, get that sort of a uh, advantage. And also AI technology has already been uh, incorporated in uh, uh, pathology, day-to-day uh, -day pathology reporting in Western countries. Now, this is one of my colleagues who is working in UK. And so she says that uh, uh, the uh, for common biopsies like uh, breast and prostate, they have already uh, doing them uh, using AI technology. So rather than looking at the, through the microscope, and they now the the images comes uh, th uh, and the 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 areas where we need to be uh, seen is selected by AI and then we just have to interpret them. So there are some myths. Uh, one is that uh, the post grad the the pathology is all about memorizing large volumes of information. It is not. The, the, the postgraduate program is an in-service program and also the learning is patient-centered learning. So you learn surrounding your patients and then uh, with the help of there has to be backing of the theory knowledge and you have to be up to date. And for that, there are, as I uh, uh, explained to you, there are many uh, programs for you to be uh, a par with the, the newest knowledge. So it's not just memorizing, uh, it's mostly, it's a skill base. So it's uh, the, the pathology is a skill that you need to uh, acquire uh, through uh, many, several years of uh, training. And also, as you have seen, it's not a, a specialty confined to the laboratory. And also, in Sri Lanka, mostly the pathologists are females. But in other countries, even in India, it's not so. Uh, equal or higher number of uh, pathologists are males in these countries. Due to some reason, uh, mostly we have females in our uh, community. Uh, so men also have the opportunity. Right. So how do you enter the program? Uh, so there will be a screening test and then after the screening test, after two years of training, you have your MD part one. Then after another two years, MD part two, after successful completion of MD part two, you have uh, one year of local training, one year of foreign training. And then if everything goes smooth, you can become a board certified pathologist in uh 
in six uh, years' time. Now, we had our most recent MD Part 2 exam in uh, April this year, and there the, the pass rate was uh, almost close to 90%. And uh, the uh, the eligibility criteria to sit for the screening test, you have to have completed your internship and one year post intern period. And uh, there are a lot of PG centers uh, in main cities or all in main cities. Uh, uh, mostly Colombo, in and in, in and around Colombo, there are many centers and also Candy and uh, uh, goal. Right now, we will see about the hematology program. So, uh, out of all three uh, uh, the specialties, hematology is the most clinically orientated program. There are there is a laboratory diagnosis pass part as well as clinical hematology where you uh, uh, take care of your uh, patients with hematological uh, uh, diseases. Uh, so you have to run uh, many hematology clinics, general hematology, then the thalassemia clinics, hemophilia clinics, and sometimes even thrombosis clinics. And uh, some uh, the, the hematologists manage uh, some of the hematological malignancies. And several, uh, some hospitals have uh, daycare units and few hospitals have even has, uh, they have uh, hematology wards. Uh, now, for example, in teaching hospital Peradenia, we have a daycare unit where uh, a short stay patients like those who need blood transfusion, resections, like things are managed. And uh, as a result, uh, the PG training includes two years of clinical rotation like general medicine, uh, surgery, oncology, so on. And since there's uh, more clinical part, so there are on calls, but still the, the work stress is not as much as the pure clinical fields. Again, the 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 PG program is uh, similar. The, the structure is similar, uh, so it's altogether six year uh, program. Now here, for as an eligibility criterion, you have to have uh, uh, medicine appointment done six months of medicine during your internship or during post internship period. So now, chemical pathology. Now, chemical pathology is uh, uh, the about uh, biochemical basis of diseases and also the biochemical investigation. So as a chemical pathologist, your main job is to maintain the chemical pathol uh, the biochemical chemistry lab laboratory in a reliable manner so you have to have your uh, the 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 test uh, highly quality controlled uh, you have to have your uh, mlt strain and also the lab has to be very much clinically relevant so therefore you uh, the chemical pathologists need to have a constant communication with the clinicians to make sure that the the lab is running in a clinically relevant manner. And also you have to uh, uh, instruct the clinicians on uh, the, the requesting certain uh, laboratory investigations and how to prepare the patient and the interpretation of the results in certain specific ones like hormonal assays things, right? And so uh, the, the nowadays, uh, no tertiary care hospital can run uh, without a chemical pathologist in the laboratory because it's so important to have these things streamlined. Of course, even as a hematologist, you it's your uh, hematological duty, uh, the, the hematologist's duty to maintain the hematological test in a reliable manner. So here, chemical pathology, the there are, uh, again, you have to uh, uh, participate in MDTs and postgraduate training period includes six months of clinical rotation. Again, no on-calls, flexible uh, working schedules, 
and therefore low work related stress right again the similar structure uh, here uh, for to to be eligible to sit for the screening test one has to have medicine or pediatrics 6 months during the internship or the post internship period right so the selection exam for all three specialties there is a common selection screening exam there is the mcq so we here we test the the there are mcqs from pathology general pathology and the systematic pathology hematology and chemical pathology so so long we had uh, five mcqs for microbiology but from next selection exam onwards we are going to get rid of it but before before you before you uh, uh, sit for the selection exam, please make sure that you get it confirmed uh, uh, with the uh, from the 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 uh, reading the prospectus, right? So if you are su successful uh, uh, from the screening exam, that is fifty percent. Uh, there are. Three separate exams for each specialty, the pathology, hematology, and chemical pathology. We will be having three exams. So uh, depending on your uh, preferences, you can take one or more exams. For example, if you're only uh, interested in histopathology, you can take the histopathology exam only. But if you want to keep your options open, then you can take two or even all three exams. So uh, that depends on your preferences. Right. So that's about the, the selection exam. So for the, the, the specific details, uh, I recommend that you go to the PJM website and there are uh, uh, separate prospectus for each uh, category. Uh, so histopathology, there will be some changes. Uh, because we are going through a revision uh, 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 and to make the program more more uh, the trainer set, uh, friendly and to uh, uh, sort of iron out some some of the the, the difficulties so I am thankful to PEMSA for this opportunity for me to into uh, uh, the introduce you the the pathology fields and also my colleagues for their input and they help me a lot with a lot of the input to pre uh, prepare this uh, the uh, preparation uh, uh, presentations and also i got these uh, the 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 funny images from these websites and so these are some of our uh, pathology consultants and also uh, uh, trainees. So we have a very nice community. Yes, thank you very much for listening. Hello, I'm Dr. Dhanushi Vijay Kohn, currently serving as an acting consultant committee physician at the Epidemiology Unit of the Ministry of Health, Sri Lanka. I welcome you all to the annual career guidance session on Community Medicine as a Postgraduate Speciality organized by the Peradhiniya Medical School Alumni Association. Now, Before you roll your eyes and mentally prepare for a snooze fest at the mention of Community Medicine, I want you to know that I've been where you are now and so have others. But let's just forget about all those preconceived notions and try to approach this with an open mind. So community medicine is one of the older specialities, but many are not familiar with the term community medicine, especially when you take the global community. They are more familiar with the term public health or preventive medicine, mainly because community medicine, it encompasses various facets of both preventive medicine as well as public health. So you can see that the terminology can be used interchangeably. So if we are to explain the main differences between a clinician's work and a community physician's work, I think this picture is the best depiction of the, the, that those differences. 
So as you can see, there's a flood situation in a house and you can see that one person is frantically mopping up the floor, symbolizing the immediate clinical care that we are all familiar with. It's vital work, obviously, and it addresses the needs of an individual. On the other hand, you can, have, you can see that there's another person who, has, who is heading straight to the source of the problem, attempting to close the tap that is causing this flood. So this is community medicine in action for you. It's not just about treating the symptoms or an individual, but it's about tackling the root causes and striving for long-term solutions and trying to improve the health and well-being of the entire community. So in essence, community medicine broadens your narrow tunnel of clinical vision, expanding it to encompass the bigger picture. When we talk about the scope of community medicine, I'm sure all of you have been introduced to various components of community medicine during your undergraduate studies, uh, ma mainly biostatistics, epidemiology, community health, environmental health, health systems, health economics, occupational and safety, healthcare administration, planning and management, emergency preparedness and response, global health, preventive health care, public health, as well as social work. So during your postgraduate studies, you will encounter a broader scope beyond what you have learned as an undergraduate, diving deeper into these areas, not only to just gain practical exposure, but also to have a more comprehensive understanding of community medicine have mastered these competencies, you have the flexibility to pursue different career paths, both locally as well as internationally. So these career paths consist but definitely are not limited to epidemiology, health system management, uh, then there's jobs available in community health, then you have career paths in environmental health, occupational health and safety as well as emergency preparedness and response so as you can see the roles range from researchers program managers to specialists in various fields at workplaces community physicians get to experience diverse work environments throughout their careers uh, in the ministry of health alone there are over 330 card positions available for consultant community physicians and up to now only just over 70 of these positions have been filled. These positions spread across various institutions that all of you all are familiar with, which includes the Ministry of Health itself, the Family Health Bureau, the Epidemiology Unit, Health Promotion Bureau, uh, the National Institute of Health Sciences, the Special Programs, Provincial Director of Health Services Officers, Regional Director of Health Services Officers, as well as in hospitals. There are also work opportunities in universities for consultant community physicians, both medical and non-medical in both private as well as government sectors. This also includes the Kotelawala Defense University. They can also work at institutions such as the Army Medical Research Institute or even establish their own general practice. Then there are opportunities available at NGOs that is non-governmental organizations such as uh, as well as international agencies such as the UN with the most common UN agencies being the World Health Organization or the WHO, the UNESCO and uh, the United Nations Population Fund as well as the International Organization for Migration. a brief overview of the entire community medicine program. Uh, the first hurdle is the MSc selection exam. So as with all postgraduate studies, you need one year post internship experience to sit for the MSc selection exam. The exam will be held once a year and the dates are available on the PGM website. So closer to the exam, the College of Community Physicians of Sri Lanka organizes a division course in community medicine on weekends, which I personally found to be very useful. 
and once you pass this election exam you will be released from your current workplace to attend the PGIM for a full time one year course. The master's course includes lectures, clinical training, practical sessions along with a research project leading to a dissertation and at the end of the year you will face the MSc exam followed by the submission of your dissertation. And once you are done with the exam and complete your dissertation, you are eligible to sit for the MD selection exam. This exam is typically scheduled 3 to 4 months after the MSc. During this period, you will receive a temporary attachment at the Ministry of Health or one of the institutions I previously mentioned. So once you get through the MD selection exam, you will be released from that placement and reattached to the PGIM for a period of 3 to 4 months until your MD Part 1 exam. Following the MD Part 1 exam as a part of your training, you will be attached to the NIHS that is the National Institute of Health Sciences and then another 6 months at MOH office of your choice. So once the MOH appointment is completed, you will be attached to another training unit or a university to complete your research work. And once you submit your research and get through the VIVA, you will be eligible, uh, you will become a senior registrar in community medicine and you have, have to complete one year of senior registrar period and then you can go for your overseas training for another year. So if you want further information, you can freely download the community medicine MSc and MD prospectus from the PGM website. Many exams passing rates vary in community medicine. Qualifying exams usually see pass rates of 65% to 80% and MSCMD exams also maintain similar rates, typically ranging from 60% to 80%. However, the final exams uh, have much uh, higher pass rates, usually around 80 to 100%. Finally, I'd like to shed light on the advantages of choosing community medicine as a specialty. Service provision as a community physician, you'll be able to shape population health through policy development, health promotion and disease prevention. Furthermore, you'll be able to directly engage with communities, stakeholders and policy makers. While work hours can vary depending on the specific role and the organization, community medicine often offers more predictable schedules and a better work-life balance compared to clinical practice settings. And uh, when we talk about financial benefits alongside salaries and extra duties, uh, you'll be offered additional income opportunities through consultancies and international fellowships. This will further benefit your career. About opportunities, research and publications are integral component of community medicine. You will also be able to pursue various career paths and it will open doors to global opportunities. Uh, you will get to work with international agencies and you will be able to collaborate and e these collaborations will even lead to jobs at international agencies where you can make a real difference on a global scale. Furthermore, it opens doors to a world of creativity, continuous learning and boundless opportunities for professional growth. Through your work, you have the power to shape the future of healthcare and make meaningful impact on a global scale. I hope this inspires you and provides valuable insight into this rewarding speciality. Thank you for joining us. Congratulations to all of you on your success in final MBBS. I'm Professor Nilanti Disanayak, Professor in Microbiology at the Department of Microbiology, Faculty of Medicine, University of Peradeniya, and working as an honorary consultant microbiologist at Teaching Hospital Peradeniya also. So I'm going to introduce you the postgraduate opportunities available in the field of microbiology through the PGIM, University of Colombo. So basically, uh, we have a postgraduate diploma in medical microbiology. That is the first step in entering into the microbiology stream. So to 
get into the postgraduate diploma in medical microbiology you have to go through a screening test and qualify and then can enroll get enrolled for the diploma in medical microbiology so once you have completed the diploma in medical microbiology uh, you can opt to do your md in medical microbiology or there are few opportunities for uh, people who are interested in to continue your md in medical virology if you proceed with the md in medical microbiology uh, following that following completion of your md exam at the end of the uh, course in md in medical microbiology you would get the md in uh, medical microbiology postgraduate degree and following that you may proceed to go through or subspecialize in medical mycology there are few opportunities for few people uh, through the pgim and each year they would advertise the number of vacancies that are going to be available the uh, if not you can continue to be a trainee in md in medical microbiology and you can continue to do the local training and the foreign training in md in medical microbiology and you can become a uh, board certified consultant in medical microbiology basically a consultant microbiologist so if you opt to do md in medical virology following completion of your diploma in medical microbiology then following completion of your md in medical virology uh, there are two years of local one year local training and another year overseas training and following completion of that you can qualify as a board certified consultant in medical microbiology basically a consultant virologist and if you opt to do uh, medical mycology you can board certify as a medical mycologist basically a consultant mycologist so these are the programs that are running at the moment but the md in immunology has got approved through the pgim and it's in pipeline hopefully it would be uh, starting uh, very soon so why you should choose microbiology microbiology is a fascinating field as all of you know very well and you already gone through microbiology and immunology in your undergraduate days so to qualify to get into the uh, diploma in medical microbiology stream you have to go through the screening test and i'm pretty sure the knowledge that you have already got in microbiology and parasitology is enough to enough for you to get through the screening test so uh, mainly in the diploma in medical microbiology you will be learning about the bacteriology general microbiology bacteriology virology immunology mycology as well as parasitology so this uh, things would be done during the diploma years and after that depending on what you want to proceed with the program changes so uh, we would talk about why you want to do microbiology okay so this is a fascinating field as i told you and a ever changing field ever updating basically and uh, if you are a graduate who wants to update yourself and who want to be in a dynamic field so microbiology is one of the fields that you can consider again uh, at the moment there are considerable number of consultant microbiologist in the country in most of the hospitals and i'm pretty sure you have got experience 
uh, you have seen them working in the hospitals so consultant microbiologists are basically stationed at the laboratories in the hospitals but we look after the laboratory aspect as well as we go to wards and we get referrals and again we do routine ICU rounds and HDU rounds and uh, we continue to follow patients who are in the wards but with the current system we don't have our own wards or our own clinics or uh, our own patients actually so we are working in collaboration with almost all the consultants in the hospital so if you are an individual who would like to uh, work in groups work in collaboration with others so welcome to microbiology you would be more uh, happy to work in such a field where you would be collaborating not only with the hospital consultants but with the administrators uh, other medical and paramedical staff as well as the public health sector so you would be working in collaboration with almost everybody in the field of medicine or field of health care so this is a very interesting field and you can do a change in patients life actually you would see the change when you start working and you would see what you can do uh, not only in the government sector actually even in the private sector there are enough opportunities for consultant microbiologists consultant virologists as well as consultant mycologists uh, and if you are thinking of going abroad and if you are thinking of overseas opportunities of course you can search and see there are enough and more opportunities for qualified consultants through the microbiology stream so you can actually search it in the web and see the opportunities you would see one of the highly demanded fields in certain countries like united kingdom is medical microbiology so you don't have to worry in getting into the uh, stream of microbiology it's no longer a field of women actually like there are uh, well qualified consultant microbiologists who are men who are doing really well and doing a great service uh, to the country or to the world as well so uh, another fascinating thing about microbiology is like microbiology is anyway directly connected with the research field so if you are interested in continuing your career in clinical medicine as well as in research field so this is an a little bit of lab oriented uh, field so this is a field that you can enjoy almost all of those so to apply for the selection exam in medical microbiology you should have mbbs degree registered with the slmc completion of your internship and one year of experience following your internship as a doctor and then you can apply for the selection exam uh, which is annually advertised by the PGIM and you can find the dates from the PGIM exam calendar so the selection exam uh, has got a main component of uh, written component which is comprised of MCQs and essay so it's not difficult actually uh, you can get through the selection exam with the knowledge that you have already got in microbiology and parasitology as a uh, medical undergraduate there would be a viva but the main component is the written exam so uh, there are limited number of opportunities so depending on your marks uh, 
the candidates would be selected for the diploma in medical microbiology course so once it's selected the training would commence and it would be basically a nine months taught course where the basics of microbiology would be taught the general microbiology bacteriology virology mycology public health microbiology parasitology everything would be taught again uh, in a more extensive manner and the laboratory testing and uh, the skills that you need would also be practically done inside laboratories and you'd be taught and you'd be coached on laboratory testing and followed by that you would have five months in service training in an accepted uh, training lab hospital laboratory under uh, the su direct supervision of a consultant microbiologist this is again to improve your uh, laboratory processing and interpretation and then liaising with the patients and the clinical staff in communicating with the laboratory reports so followed by that in com uh, following completion of your taught course and the in service training you would have the diploma exam and that's again an extensive exam where your theory is being tested through a written part and your uh, practical ability of laboratory testing that you have mastered during the diploma course would be tested uh, in a series of practical exams so following completion of the exam if you have gone through the diploma in medical microbiology examination then you can proceed with uh, either with md in medical microbiology or md in medical virology okay uh, usually this diploma is a very uh, extensive course and the candidates would take up the diploma if they are interested in continuing with the md in medical microbiology or md in uh, medical virology or uh, if you are interested in parasitology following completion of the diploma in medical microbiology you can opt to do md in medical parasitology also that arm is also available but th that is again under the board of study in microbiology but the md in medical parasitology course runs separately so uh, i don't think any of the candidates would proceed with the diploma in medical microbiology only for the purpose of obtaining a postgraduate diploma because there are much more easier diplomas than this and uh, this diploma would usually be done by candidates who are interested really interested in uh, microbiology and really in uh, interested in a career in microbiology uh, for the future so this is a breakdown of the uh, diploma in medical microbiology and when you see the breakdown you would see that we are going through uh, most of the important aspects of a microbiologist and uh, this is not a diploma that usually the mbbs qualified doctors would select out just for the uh, just for the interest of getting a diploma because it's an extensive course uh, usually the ones who select the diploma in medical microbiology or ones who go through the diploma in medical microbiology would definitely proceed with a md okay so you you can see the kind of like the diversity that is uh, included in the program in diploma
So following completion of the diploma, if you want to do MD in medical microbiology, uh, the total course would be two years and nine months, including further improvement of your laboratory skills and the interpretational skills and the laboratory management, then uh, clinicals, including patient management and infection control, public health microbiology, and there would be a component of research where you would be requested to do a research for three months. So this is the current program in MD in medical microbiology that is uh, running at the moment but uh, the Board of Study in Microbiology has updated the pro program and PGIF has given the approval for the updated program and uh, that is going to start soon and uh, perhaps it may be the updated program that you all are going to go through if any of you are interested. So, uh, please go through the website of the PGIA as uh, if you are interested in doing the screening for uh, screening in microbiology to get selected onto the diploma in medical microbiology. So, the P, if once the PGIA website gets updated for the newly approved uh, prospectus, the program structure will get changed basically the main change is we have included a six months training as a uh, in the medical wards six months training in medicine without on calls so that is the main change that has included so but the time duration of the md remains intact not changed okay after two years and nine months of training so you can sit for the md in medical microbiology again an extensive exam where theory is being assessed with mcqs and an and essay papers which includes microbiology gen, uh, general microbiology bacteriology virology immunology mycology and little bit of parasitology also and then extensive practicals uh, in bacteriology as well as practical exams in uh, virology and mycology and there would be some OSPs those would have some component of immunology and little bit of parasitology too and again there would be a viva exam and uh, by this time you have done your dissertation so there would be some there would be a viva on your dissertation also so this is a comprehensive examination going on for uh, something like more than a week of course and if you go through the exam then if you want to continue in MD in medical microbiology you have to go through the post MD training for two years the first year local training as a senior registrar in microbiology and the second year OCS training and that would qualify you for the board certification okay so this is basically the outline of the training after getting through MD in medical microbiology if you are interested in uh, proceeding with MD in medical microbiology so that path is also open for a limited number of trainees per year depending your merit order and your willingness to do virology you can select out so the duration would still be two years and nine months and again this training would have the training 
uh, in the virology labs there are a lot of different virology labs in mri medical research institute in borel so quite a part would of your training would be laboratory oriented in the mri colombo with a hospital rotation and some special appointments with a research component and uh, then there would be an extensive exam for the medical virology in md and uh, following successful completion of your md in medical virology for the board certification purposes again you have to still undergo another two years training post md first year local training as a senior registrar post md second year overseas training for your board certification purposes and then only you can request for the board certification following completion of all these requirements so basically if you look at uh, um, your career starting from this md sorry diploma in medical microbiology getting md in medical microbiology or md in medical virology would consume something like 6 years but uh, don't think it's a too long quite a long time it's not quite a long time but uh, it's a considerable time true but at the end you are going to get a degree worth of spending that time and you are not is spending that much of time either so following the completion of the exam the md in medical microbiology there are few vacancies offered in certain years for md in medical mycology that is again a sub specialty okay and uh, if you are interested in doing that so you have to request for that and uh, then the board of study in microbiology would uh, see whether you are suitable for that and after that they would offer 3 years of training further training in mycology so 2 years would be local training out of that one year would be a, a senior registrar training and the other year would be uh, spent in a recognized hospital locally under the supervision of a consultant mycologist and the third year would be overseas training okay so a new opportunity is awaiting that's md in immunology so already it has got approved by the pgim and the prospectus is going to get out soon hopefully by the time when uh, you all have done your internship and one year post intern uh, training so by the time when you all are getting ready for your post graduate exams this would be out for sure so look out for the md in medical immunology prospectus in the pgm website too so that, because that's going to be a new opportunity brand new opportunity so i'm pretty sure by, by this time you'll have uh, shortlisted few post graduate degrees that you are interested in but uh, still you have to go through your internship and keep your eyes and ears open when you are going through your internship and uh, see what makes you most interested because whatever you choose for your career most likely hopefully you have to continue it for the rest of your life so that has to be something that you like doing for the rest of your life and 
something that you enjoy because as you can understand and as you have seen uh, throughout all these years and as you would be seeing would be experiencing during your internship being a specialist is a very uh, dedicated job where most of the specialists are on call for 24 hours in 365 days okay that's not a easy thing unless you enjoy doing that so think of that also not only the financial gains so think of what you like most and what you enjoy most along with the uh, other parameters you know the recognition and the financial gains and the available opportunities locally available opportunities overseas everything together and select out what is best for you so i hope that most of you who are listening this presentation have just finished your final mbbs and are just uh, wondering what are the opportunities that are available you to uh, for you to proceed in your future professional life to specialize so uh, this presentation would have given you some thoughts about microbiology and you'd be hearing a lot of other presentations too so uh, i would hope that you would select something a field that you are interested in that's very important and that you would enjoy when you are practicing if not uh, you know medicine is it's a very intensive field where we have to work most of us have to work uh, 365 days all 24 hours as the single specialist in our station once we qualify so unless we enjoy what we are doing unless we like what we are doing we won't be happy with our lives so think about that think very deeply whether you like the subject and again think whether you can practice it happily until you finish practicing okay not only until you retire but until you finish practicing so all the good luck for your future and select a field that you are happy with i wish you a good day and a future i am dr chandana vijay singh director district general hospital kegol I will introduce you the career pathway of medical administration postgraduate education. In the past, Sri Lankan health system was managed by senior doctors or medical consultants in any other field. However, it was understood that advanced management knowledge and applications are needed to manage the current health system. Therefore, Ministry of Health and the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine develop a new discipline that is the medical administration discipline in this discipline medical doctors are trained as modern managers to run the current health system it includes the ministry other hospitals campaigns and provincial health system medical administration course has two programs one is msc and the other one is md on the other hand the doctors have two exist from the course one is after the msc and the other one is after the md and board certification any any doctor registered in slmc with 3 year experience and dental doctors with five way experience are eligible to select the course selection exam has a theory papers and a oral examination maximum 
maximum 25 candidates are recruits uh, to the MSc program. The MSc program is a 18 month program with the research. At the end of the program, candidates are evaluated by a written exam and a viva and the research. Eligibility to the MD course is candidates with MSc within 10 year period. At the beginning, there is a 3 month crash course. Thereafter, candidates, candidates must face the part 1 exam. It is also has written papers and viva. Depending on the available training stations, number of eligible candidates will be selected for this program. Usually it is about 12 to 15 candidates. Really part 2 is a 2 year program with the intervention research project. Selected candidates must implement a modern management method to solve identified health system issues and show results. Additionally, they must complete a portfolio also. At the end, candidates are assessed by a written exam, VIVA and the research project. Those who success successful in MD medical administration exam have to undergo a post-MD training. It has two components. First one is one year local training and the other one is minimum one year overseas training. The local training has two payments. One is in the ministry and the other one is in a selected hospital or a campaign. Overseas training is in a training center approved by the board of study. After the completion of the overseas training, candidate, candidates must face for a portfolio based PBCA viva. Thereafter, they should do a presentation before the board of study to certify it as a consultant in medical administration. Being qualified in medical administration is not enough to hold a director post. They must go into the medical administration grade. It has two grades. First one is junior administration grade. Thereafter, the senior administration grade. To enter into the medical administration grade, they must face for an interview. Doctors with minimum criteria of MSc are eligible for a face the recruitment process. Deputy directors in large hospitals and medical superintendents are the junior medical administrative grade doctors. Junior medical administration grade has a three year probation period. Thereafter, another interview to enter into the senior medical administration grade. However, in the senior medical administration grade, with the increase in number of MD holders and board certified consultants, those who with higher qualifications get better chance in getting into a good post like director post in large hospitals or uh, post like provincial directors. You may have heard about debut director generals. It is the next grade. With the available vacancies, eligible doctors in the senior medical administration grade can apply for those posts. It also has an interview. But don't forget if you are a consultant in medical administration in any grade, it may be either junior medical administration grade or senior medical administration grade, you get a salary equal to a deputy director general. Medical administration field has advantages and disadvantages. As this, as this specialty is a newly developed one, it has more room to develop and being a director in a hospital or a campaign is a pay stage. Similarly, you get some additional perks also. 
यू गेट अ ट्रांसपोर्ट अलावेंस और अब ऑफिस वेहीकल लाइक डबल कैब और जीप एंड यू गेट नॉन प्रैक्टिसिंग अलावेंसेस आल्सो बट देयर आर सम मेजर डिसएडवांटेजेस इन दिस फील्ड वन इज यू कांट प्रैक्टिस एज अ डॉक्टर इफ यू सिलेक्टेड दिस फील्ड अनदर वन इज you don't get a paid job during your overseas training but you have lots of opportunities in other sectors uh, technical post in un agencies like who or unicef and you can get jobs in private sector hospitals in additionally you can continue your career as a medical administration consultants in various field like project management then the health economics and various new fields are there before i conclude this presentation i would like to give this message sri lankan health system is looking for dedicated and energetic young doctors with good leadership qualities and having interest in the field of management with integrity and transparency creativity and innovativeness and the capacity to work in a stressful environment without a rest are welcome to the medical administration field I would like to thank the Peradeniya Medical School Alumni Association for giving this opportunity to present uh, to you uh, about the health informatics career path uh, for doctors in Sri Lanka. This is a relatively young field in Sri Lanka uh, and I'm sure you will be having a lot of questions. Uh so what is health informatics? Uh, I would say it's one of the fastest growing areas in health. Uh, and it uh, involves the intelligent use of uh, information technology for patient, better patient care um, and it's uh, actually an intersect of uh, multiple uh, fields uh, including computer science information science and the health care which you know best um, so sri lanka is one of the pioneering countries to have uh, medical doctors certified board certified uh as uh, health informaticians uh we follow uh the united states of america where you have similar pathways and uh, in sri lanka uh you need to have one year uh, post uh, intern experience uh, and both uh, the dental surgeons as well as medical doctors are uh, eligible to sit the exam uh, a screening exam uh, which consists of Uh, multiple choice questions um, and you can enter the uh, msc program which is there running for 24 months uh, on completion of that um, which includes a dissertation as well as an exam uh, you will be assigned as medical officers of health informatics or into surgeons of health informatics uh, and you would need to complete one more year of a, uh, um in the ministry uh, to gain experience for you to be eligible to sit for the md uh, program and uh, in the md program uh, you would uh, need to cover two years of uh, registration uh, and one year local training as a senior registrar and a foreign placement thereafter there will be a pre board certification assessment following that you will be uh, awarded uh, the uh, specialist uh, appointment from the ministry of health and uh, to whom is this um, uh, uh, this specialty is uh, well suited i would say if, if you are good at uh, it as well as the medicine uh, and your friends uh, consider you to be the go to person um 
for their IT uh, queries, I would say uh, the program will help you polish up um, on uh, many scientific aspects of health informatics and you can uh, thrive uh, in the field. And uh, what do we do in the Ministry of Health uh, uh, when you are appointed as a MO a dental surgeon in health informatics or a consultant in health informatics? So these are the main areas that we uh, cover. So uh, we work on policy and strategy and uh, we have drafted the uh, uh, health information policy uh, for the Ministry of Health. And we do a lot of advocacy work uh, for digital health, um, highlighting its capacity uh, to enhance the healthcare delivery. Uh, then we do capacity building for other health categories because uh, as even with the MBBS programs, most of the other programs do not cover uh, this specialty. So um, certain things uh, they need to know. Uh, we uh, you know do capacity building programs. And we also need uh, digital health infrastructure to run most of the solutions that we develop and deploy in hospitals, and we work on that. And it's also very important that we monitor and evaluate the programs that are in place, um, so we have uh, arms to do that as well. Uh, digital health research is a very important aspect because it's a young field and you have a lot of questions uh, that needs to be uh, researched and answered. Uh, more than that, I think we do uh, the systems development and implementation. Uh, we, uh, we are the bridge between the medical field and the IT field. So we, we are in a very niche position, uh, knowing both the IT, uh, uh, you know, uh, knowing the IT domain as well as the health domain following the completion of the uh, uh, postgraduate training, uh, we are in a very good place to support uh, development of uh, digital health systems and uh, implement, in, implement them in uh, our healthcare settings. So uh, where do you get uh, appointed once you complete the program? So we have a lot of people in the central um, uh, you know, in Colombo uh, and suburbs. Uh, so in the even in the Ministry of Health, we have a lot of uh, health informaticians as well as uh, medical officers and dental surgeons in health informatics because you need, unlike other fields, you need uh, central coordination of the work as well as some infrastructure that you have to uh, create so that um, the health records that we uh, you know, generate from hospitals are interoperable uh, and they can be accessed from anywhere in the country. Uh, then we have the provincial departments, uh, so the nine provinces, and then some of the regional directors of health services uh, offices also, we have uh, health implementations placed. Um, then we have the public health campaigns. Uh, most of the public health campaigns current uh, in current, uh, uh, you know, settings, they run uh, aggregate digital health uh, platforms. Um, so we support them. And we have a, a health information management unit structure created in the hospital setup as well. So in national teaching and specialized hospitals, we have uh, health information management units which are headed by uh, a health information and uh, the circulars have been issued and uh, relevant, uh, you know, the infrastructure is generally provided when you get appointed to uh, these places. And what are the opportunities? Like uh, with any other medical uh, field, uh, the uh, MD in health informatics uh, is uh, recognized by the uh, medical service minute. Uh, so you get appointed as a uh, consultant in health informatics once you um, uh, achieve the board certification. And if it's a MSc graduate, uh, then you get appointed uh, in the uh, as a medical officer and in, or a dental surgeon in health informatics. And uh, currently we are in um, discussions with the Ministry of Health uh, to incorporate uh, the MSc graduates uh, as an intermediate cadre uh, so that uh, you don't have to move out of the uh, field uh, into uh, general annual chances uh, following, uh, you know, uh, following, following the temporary appointment you get uh, post PGIM. So uh, we are currently in discussion, but uh, anyway, what we have noticed is uh, uh, 
because uh, the uh, the other graduate, uh, the general medical officers cannot uh, cover the responsibilities of medical officers in health informatics. They are not generally released, uh, though they get uh, chances. So we are trying to formalize uh, what is happening now uh, through this intermediate card. And out of the Ministry of Health, uh, we see a lot of people uh, going for uh, uh, foreign jobs. So I think uh, a couple of years back when we uh, analyzed the data, uh, more than 25% of the uh, graduates uh, from the MSc program are no longer in the country. Um, and one reason could be that you don't need uh, medical certification uh, in, in, in those, uh, you know, the host country uh, if you are going there as a health informatician. Um, and Public Health Informatics Fellowship Program of the CDC Atlanta, USA, uh, is one uh, one such um, you know place we have more than four or five people uh, you know working there, um, and uh, we also uh, secure PhD opportunities. Um, I know uh, certain uh, colleagues of mine working uh, you know uh, reading for PhDs in Australia, Ireland, uh, USA, etc. And uh, digital health has been. Uh, uh, priority area in uh, WHO and UN, UN organizations as well, UNICEF, uh, etc. Um, so um, there are opportunities uh, to, um, you know, work for these uh, organizations. And also you have uh, private uh, consultancy uh, work, um, you know, entities also interested in your uh, knowledge uh, that you gain through the program. And you also get to travel and present what you do in Sri Lanka. Uh, for example, last year I managed to, you know, go to three countries, uh, Taiwan, Indonesia, and Malawi. Uh, so um, we do exciting work in Sri Lanka. So uh, people are interested. Uh, if you engage in, uh, uh, you know, a lot of digital health interventions and then you write about them, uh, you get the travel opportunities as well. And some of the Colleagues also do have uh, this digital health uh, service provider entity set up, uh, more or less private uh, companies. Uh, they do either consultancy or um, have some uh, stake in them. Um, they provide services uh, to uh, outside of Sri Lanka. So I think um, I have seen a lot of people migrating um, um, and earning better uh, salaries in, uh, you know, USD. Uh, but I always say is, um, Health informatics will allow you to earn in US dollars and probably spend in Sri Lankan rupees. That is, I would consider the best of both worlds. Uh, and uh, depending on your interest and the capacity, uh, you should be able to secure some of these opportunities. And in summary, uh, uh, health informatics is a rapidly uh, expanding uh, field, uh, both locally and globally. Uh, and the specialization pathway is uh, quite uh, established. Uh, and then uh, we have uh, ministry uh, opportunities as well as outside opportunities for um, our graduates. Um, you can have more information about the programs in the uh, uh, prospectus uh, published in the uh, PGIM website. Uh, so I would recommend you to go and read uh, about the you know, selection exams and as well as uh, about uh, the overall program. Uh, and I would like to thank uh, again uh, the Peradini Medical School uh, Alumni Association for the opportunity. Uh, and you may reach me uh, if you have any um, further questions. I'm more than happy to assist. And the college also do have um, uh, a WhatsApp group uh, which uh, you can join uh, if you are interested. And in that, uh, I have seen people sharing past papers and you know other uh, things that are helpful for um, those who are sitting the exam. And we also plan to uh, conduct uh, some orientations uh, prior to the uh, MSc and the uh, MD uh, exams. Thank you very much again. This presentation is about clinical oncology. My name is Dr. Damayanti Piris. And 
if you look at the overview of clinical oncology, it is a subject that uh, that is used to treat all aspects of uh, cancer patients. It includes diagnosis, treatment, and management decision making. Uh, for, when treating cancer patients, we should have a holistic approach, and oncologists should provide comprehensive care to cancer patients, including their medical treatment, supportive care, and palliative care whenever necessary. And the important thing about our field is that oncologists is the person who will make a very big impact on the lives of patients and their families. And what is different to other specialities is that our clinical oncology is a very dynamic, very rapidly evolving field with regard to the advancements of the treatment and research element and technology is developing and treatment modalities are developing. What we learned five years ago may not be correct at the present current scenario. And it is a field that needs very good interdisciplinary collaboration. Oncologists work closely with all the members of the multidisciplinary teams. All malignancies, all patients ideally should go through multidisciplinary teams, which include all other specialties. And what we need as skills and qualities to become an oncologist is one important thing is to have compassion and empathy. If you want to treat a patient, you need to have these uh, qualities in yourself. And oncologists have to do critical thinking because all the patients will not come as a textbook case. And sometimes with our knowledge, we have to make decisions and we may have to adapt to evolving treatment strategies. And other important, very important skill is communication skill. And we may have to break bad news. We may have to give the options of treatment to patients and their families, and especially to our other team members of our healthcare team. So these three skills are a must, or you will develop when you are becoming a clinical oncologist. And in our country, we have a discipline called clinical oncologist. Clinical oncology includes medical oncology that is using chemotherapy for a patient and radiation oncology that is using radiotherapy for a patient. This is the practice in UK and in US and in uh, Australia, uh, medical oncology and radiation oncology are different subjects. And during the training program in our country, one can subspecialize into a pediatric oncologist or into a hemato-oncologist if you so desire. And the scope of the work in a clinical oncologist will include adult malignancies, except their hematological counterpart. Hemato-oncologists will handle all hematological malignancies and bone marrow transplantation is within their forte. And pediatric oncologists will handle all malignancies, including leukemias or hematological malignancies and bone marrow transplants in children. And in our country, up to 18 years, we consider them in the pediatric age group. Up to now, the main training center is National Cancer Institute, Sri Lanka, that is the uh, Apeksha Hospital at Mahargama, uh, where the training takes place until MD Part 2 and beyond. And for, for post-MD training, National Hospital Candy on and Teaching Hospital Karapiti Oncology Units are also recognized by the TGI, PGIM as post-MD training centers. 
And in our training pathway is as follows. The number of vacancies are determined by the available cadre positions in the Ministry of Health. Usually the lowest is number four and maximum is 10. And see, there is a selection exam, which is a medicine, general medicine MCP paper. And then you enter in service training program for pre-MD part one uh, course where du the duration is one year and there will be a series of lectures on subjects, uh, physics, statistics, radiobiology, cancer biology, pathology, and pharmacology. And exam is held annually. All subjects have theory and oral components. And all candidates are examined by a foreign examiner from UK. And MD part two is going on for two years and starts with the successful MD part one. There are no formal lectures, but there will be MDT meetings, uh, journal clubs, uh, group discussions, and so on, and uh, individual teaching also. And uh, uh, one has to learn all aspects of cancer diagnosis, staging, and treatment uh, using both chemotherapy and radiotherapy. And we usually follow American guidelines or European guidelines. And patients are on long-term care. So not only the initial treatment, we need to follow guidelines and do their regular follow-up also. And part two exam, uh, there are theory papers, there are short cases, there is a practical radio therapy planning session, vivas and a long case. And some of these elements may change in the near future, but basically this is the format and always there's a foreign examiner from UK and we place more emphasis on radiotherapy as it's a very important treatment modality. And once you are successful, you can continue either as a clinical oncology uh, training or you can opt to do pediatric oncology or hemato-oncology where pediatric oncology and hematology, oncology as their subspecialties have a longer training period. And overseas training, most uh, trainees find jobs in UK. We go to Australia also for jobs during their foreign training period. In UK, our training program is recognized and trainees are uh, allowed to sit for both FRCR part one and two and they are allowed to there are many trainees who will who has obtained FRCR now and before the board certification we need to complete all stages of training and there is a, a dissertation which needs to be submitted and accepted by the board of study and treatment centers in Sri Lanka once you qualify it will be a big hospital it will not be a small small peripheral hospital. All provincial hospitals are, will have radiotherapy facilities. All provincial and some base hospitals have which have uh, enough drainage patients have chemotherapy facilities also. All oncologists have access to provincial center for radiotherapy to their patients. And pediatric oncology still is centered at the National Cancer Institute. Hemato-oncology still at the National Cancer Institute and Candy, uh, National Hospital Candy, and bone marrow transplantation facilities are only available at uh, National Cancer Institute, Sri Lanka. And problems one may face is a uh, very important one, heavy workload. Cancer's numbers are ever increasing. And there is a very rapid development of the treatment options, protocols, drugs, technical details of radiotherapy. So one has to be continuously keep up with the recent developments. And there is a very big research element also. And most of the developed world centers have site-specific oncologists. Their training is the same, but they have to do uh, one or two or maybe three sites because it's almost impossible to be up to date on all anatomical sites and all cancers. We haven't progressed up to that, but it will come in the future.
and <clears throat> other very important thing is we are dealing with machines and we need to have very expensive machinery sophisticated machinery to deliver our treatment as radiotherapy to our uh, the and our knowledge and decisions are manipulated into treatment through an expensive but complicated machinery. And we need many other integrated professionals help to deliver our patient care. And this is one plan that has been done for a prostate cancer. So we need to have anatomical knowledge to locate where the tumor is, where the tumor is drained, and we need to have the knowledge of uh, our specialty to give the relevant dose to the treatment area and not to give too high doses to the other structures of the body. This is another plan uh, that has been done to, uh, for a tumor in the lung. These are the final plans that we might uh, develop into a patient. And if you have any queries or related to training, you can email me whenever time permits. I may be able to help. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Yvonne Jaivira. I'm one of the consultant nutrition physicians currently attached to National Hospital Candy. So my... Uh, aim today is to give you a career guidance pathway to become a nutrition expert and a consultant nutrition physician. So why nutrition is important in hospital setting? As you all know, nutrition burden in hospitalized patients are increasing and we commonly see malnutrition, micronutrient deficiencies, as well as we see obesity and overweight in our patients. And also, we have identified nutrition is important managing the other part of the disease. Further to the thing that I was talking, these are the evidences. Even in developed countries, 35% patients are malnourished and also 30 to 50% are at risk of malnutrition. And also, in our ICUs in India, it's found that 40% of our patients of patients are malnourished when they have been treated for other diseases in ICUs. And also in Sri Lanka, when it comes to Sri Lankan data, about 17% of cardiac patients are malnourished. And in all over the world, PICU patients, about 18 to 60%, 65% are malnourished. When it comes to micronutrient deficiencies, they are also very common, as I told early. So when it comes to intestinal transplant patients, which is done in most of the developed countries, even in developed countries, they are deficient in iron and magnesium uh, in about 95% of uh, cohort. So it is a very high number. So 20 to 38% of heart failure patients are malnourished in terms of B vitamins. And also we see overweight and obesity are very common are very common in Sri Lanka and also all over the world. As you know, overweight and obesity is a chronic disease and it can give rise to all other NCDs like diabetes, hypertension, strokes, and also cancers and worsening of mechanical problems like osteoarthritis, uh, so, so and so on. So to whom we offer clinical nutrition service to whole life cycle, so we do offer nutrition service to adults, adolescents, children, neonate, kids, under five, elderly, pregnancy, lactation, and for all of us. So who provides the nutrition support? Nutrition support team provides the nutrition support in hospital led by consultant nutrition physician. I'll show you the picture and the uh, persons who are involved in nutrition support team later. Then these are the services that we provide through our service and we do handle obesity, malnutrition, various micronutrient deficiencies, diabetes, renal disease, nutrition, liver disease, nutrition. We do have liver transplant, renal transplant patients. They, need, they do need very sound nutritional care and infection patients like HIV, HIV TB, then cardiac patients and refractory epileptic patients and IBD patients. Then surgical patients need nutrition uh, in ERAS protocol and also ICU patients. 
So this is one of the nutrition uh, support team in uh, our hospital. And you can see uh, there are senior registrars and nutrition qualified MOs and also registrars and also non-medical nutritionist and also nutrition specialist nurses. Then in right hand side, you can see my nutrition support team, the nutrition support team that I was working uh, when I was doing my foreign training in Edinburgh's Cambridge University Hospital. Uh, there are four consultants uh, in nutrition and as well, there are nutrition specialty registrars. Uh, so my colleague also worked as nutrition specialty registrar with me. And then there are uh, nutrition um, specialized nurses, nutrition specialized pharmacists, and dietitians. Uh, regarding dietitians and nutritionist role, they are basically non-medical graduates. Uh, dietitians have more clinical training than nutritionists, and they are a par part of they are, a part, they, are a, they are they are they are part of our nutrition support team. We also have nutritionists in our country. We don't have dietitians in our country. Uh, in our my team also in National Hospital Candy, we do have a nutritionist who involved in our service. Uh, she reports to consult a nutrition physician. So what is the pathway to become a consultant nutrition physician? You have to complete MBBS and then after one year, you can sit for any PGI examination. So PGI uh, handle MSc human nutrition. It's a one year course. If you qualify through the entrance examination, um, you can uh, attach PGIM and do the MSc in human nutrition. It's a theory and a practical course. And after that, you will be graduated as a medical officer in human nutrition and you'll be placed under consultant nutrition physician in major hospitals in Sri Lanka. So you can do, uh, you can be part of nutrition support team and serve, um, serve those hospitals. And also after one year, you can, you are eligible to sit for MD part one examination, which is basically MCQ examination. After that, uh, you will be placed as a registrar in clinical nutrition for in-service training as other uh, specialties then after two years you can sit for md part two examination and you will be placed as senior registrar in clinical nutrition as other field for local one year training and one year foreign training regarding foreign training centers we do have foreign training centers basically in uk and also we have australia we have in australia and canada as well so after foreign training you can be board certified as a consultant nutrition physician then regarding some of the professional bodies in Sri Lanka and as well as overseas, we do have Sri Lanka College of Nutrition Physicians as other colleges. Uh, it, is, it is also a parliament approved, cabinet approved college at the moment in Sri Lanka. And we have Sri Lanka Medical Nutrition Association. Sri Lanka Medical Nutrition Association is also a multi, uh, multi, multi-task uh, uh, professional body uh, which is the council member of European Society of Parental and Nutrition. So it's a great achievement that we achieved throughout the past years. So regarding more about the foreign affairs, you can get GMC VRN sponsorship and you can apply for foreign jobs and opportunities as for the foreign training and if you want to stay furthermore you can um, apply further and keep the GMC uh, um, with GMC and license to practice. So they do offer very good salaries and you will be placed when you go for uh, foreign training as specialty registrar in nutrition or senior clinical fellow good salary opportunities in major hospitals in UK especially and um, it's a trending field in uh, other countries as well. So you do have, uh, you will be having very good foreign jobs and opportunities. Then um, regarding other professional bodies related to nutrition, European Society of Parental and Parental Nutrition is there and Society of uh, Nutrition and Parental Nutrition for Asia is there. We do have very close relationship with those uh, professional bodies and we get those examiners and delegates and speakers for our conferences and academic events. We also participate their conferences and um, academic events uh, yearly or more than more frequently than that. And uh, this is uh, this these are some of the foreign 
uh, fairs that we had last year and we uh, our college members got some of our college members got international certification for uh, clinical nutrition training approved by European Society and Parental Angel Nutrition. So if you really need to further specialize in uh, nutrition, you can choose some of the trending fields like sports nutrition. This is a good example of such an achievement. Dr. Hasha Namaratunga is the sports performance nutrition expert attached to Sri Lanka cricket. It was uh, declared uh, recently by media. So you know uh, the salaries and their scale, salary scales and their benefits uh, when you join Sri Lanka cricket. So if you really want to specialize in other fields, you can get such opportunities. What more? We don't have emergencies. All are interested in nutrition. So we do get a lot of programs, academic events and speeches. And as well as uh, we do get good private practice as well. So do consider about uh, taking uh, clinical nutrition or becoming a nutrition physician as your career. And these are some of the references and you can log into these uh, websites and see more about learn more about clinical nutrition field and thank you very much and best wishes hi everyone i congratulate all of you who got to the final mbbs examination from the Faculty of Medicine, University of Peradeniya. So, I would like to introduce a brief guide on sports and exercise medicine to your career pathway in postgraduate specialty in Sri Lanka. What is sports and exercise medicine? It's a newly emerging branch of medicine specifically formulated to promote and intervene the total wellness of the general public and sporting individuals. So sports and exercise medicine promote safe participation in exercise, physical activity for many different reasons and requirement of the society, including general fitness, non-communicable diseases, and especially performance enhancing of sports individuals. Sports and exercise medicine has its own characteristic way of handling musculoskeletal conditions and relevant illnesses. Those are associated with physical activity and exercises in terms of both treatment and prevention. So what's the spectrum of sports and exercise medicine? It has its own hospital based clinic practice in well defined sports and exercise medicine unit. Right at the moment in Sri Lanka, we have 11 recognized sports medicine unit in government hospitals. Of course, we have some other institute as well. In addition to the clinic based clinical practice, there is a sports medical coverage done by the sports physician of the sporting event at particular venues. So, so sports physician has a role to function as a traveling physician with sports teams, individuals, both local and international sporting events, such as Olympics, Commonwealth Games, the World Cup series, and so many other events in different nature of its own sports. So exercise and physical activity prescription is one of the main thing which promote prevention as well as therapeutic measures in different conditions. So sports medicine is not an isolated field. It has a lot of integration of knowledge in different fields, mainly with sports science and also with other medical specialties. So in your career pathway, to become a sports physician in Sri Lanka, you have two steps to be followed. 
The first one is the postgraduate diploma in sports medicine. Once you completed it, then you become a medical officer in sports medicine. MD in sports and exercise medicine is the path and final examination qualification that you should achieve to become a consultant, sports and exercise medicine physician. The diploma in sports medicine. The Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, Colombo, is the authorized institute to offer this degree. And remember, diploma in sports medicine is not a fully released attachment from your working station, except for the recommended training component recommended by the PGIM. So you need to have medical degree, which is registered with Sri Lanka Medical Council. And also you should complete the one year active medical practice following full registration. That is, you should have the post intern one year requirement to apply for the pass or the screening examination of the diploma in sports medicine. So it has its own contents, lecture demonstrations, workshops, clinical sessions, field work, distance education modules. And different modules are being introduced in this particular diploma in sports medicine course. That is introduction to sports injuries, prevention and rehabilitation, introduction to sports medicine and health sciences, some medical aspect of exercise and sports, practical sports medicine and research methods. The MD in sports and exercise medicine. Again, the postgraduate institute of medicine is the authorized institute to offer this degree. It's almost two and a half years period of registrar training, including senior registrar one year completion. And also ultimately you have to go for the foreign or overseas training to complete the full course of MD in sports and excess medicine. In this particular course, the candidates will be fully released as a registrar in sports and excess medicine until they complete the MD in sports medicine final exam. So you need to have the medical degree registered with the Sri Lanka Medical Council. Also, satisfactory completion of the inter internship acceptable to the Sri Lanka Medical Council. And remember, the postgraduate diploma in sports medicine is a prerequisite for you to sit for the MD in sports and exercise medicine in Sri Lanka. As I mentioned earlier, there is a two and a half year period of MD sports and exercise medicine course that all the candidates who got through the screening examination should follow this particular course during this period. So clinical attachment rotations in different disciplines, as mentioned in this slide, you can see, and also the main streams are sports, sports science, it includes sports physiology, sports biomechanics, sports psychology, and sports nutrition. So the drugs and medicine, especially the doping and pharmacology, is one of the main areas that will be covered. Also, it has a research component that every registrar should be completed. And this research should be published and also as a dissertation to the PGIM to confirm your board certification. So in addition, during this curriculum and the training period, the trainees will be given about the knowledge and practice of specific function and duties of a sports physician. And, and also specific exposure and experience. So sports medicine, 
usually it's not a very kind of a hospital bound uh, practice as i mentioned there's a lot of interaction with other fields like sports coaches trainers different sports bodies and different sports so we have locally and globally accepted and accredited professional associations that all of all the sports medicine professionals make contact and the networking with many organizations sri lanka sports medicine association is the apex body in sri lanka like other colleges in different fields asian federation of sports medicine international federation of sports medicine and international olympic committee also has a medical and scientific commission other sports scientific associations like fifa icc fiba and so many examples are there in the world american college of sports medicine and sports and exercise medicine associations of overseas countries like british association uh, like singapore medical association and south africa and you have many other association so so anyone who intention has the intention to take up sports and exercise medicine as their professional career to complete and enjoy their postgraduate studies and to become a specialist in this particular field i think uh, now the doors are open and you can choose as your favorite field thank you very much greetings to all of you first of all uh, i must thank the uh, peradeni alumni association uh, for inviting me to deliver this talk um so today uh, i am going to talk to you about the specialty of uh, clinical pharmacology and therapeutics let me introduce myself first i am uh, priyanka ranasinghe i am a professor in pharmacology um at the faculty of medicine university of colombo at as to the department of pharmacology i also happen to be the current head of the department and um, by training i am also a specialist uh, in the discipline called uh, clinical pharmacology and therapeutics which is a sub specialty uh, after completion of md medicine uh, so during the next uh, 10 minutes or so uh, i will introduce the specialist field and uh, look at the postgraduate training program leading up to the specialist qualification what kind of training that there is overseas and the different uh, career options that are available uh, for a person going into clinical pharmacology and therapeutics and how it is different uh from other sub specialties that you may encounter so you may wonder what is clinical pharmacology and uh, who is a specialist in clinical pharmacology and therapeutics now all of you i'm sure would have learned pharmacology uh, during your undergraduate time period uh, and clinical pharmacology means uh, the the use of uh, anything to do with uh, the use of medicines in humans as the word uh, clinical uh, usually implies um, so the sub specialty clinical pharmacology or a clinical pharmacologist is a medical specialty that focuses on the safe effective and economic use of medicine uh, and at the end of the day uh this is not a specialty that is new although it is new in sri lanka um i am the first uh, board certified specialist in this discipline of course there are others uh, in training after me uh, in this specialty 
um but this is a speciality that has been in existence um uh, in other countries for many years and it usually aligns with the discipline of clinical medicine um and the um, uh, with treatment of people it aligns with the discipline of toxicology um and uh, it aligns with research um it aligns with teaching it aligns with uh, development of medicines the industry it aligns with uh, regulation and so on so if you are interested in uh, striking a balance between teaching between clinical practice between research i would suggest clinical pharmacology is a discipline uh, that would suit you so the field the uh, to enter into clinical pharmacology um it is after md medicine it is a sub speciality uh, after completion of the md medicine uh, you go into this sub speciality called clinical pharmacology you may have already heard about other sub specialties under md medicine like neurology um, respiratory medicine cardiology nephrology likewise clinical pharmacology is also a sub speciality coming under this so you enter clinical pharmacology by doing the md entrance exam uh, so the the first three years is similar to any other registrar uh, you are a registrar during uh, these time periods uh, working in a medicine unit with uh, rotations in short appointments um, after that you sit for the md medicine exam and then when you get through it you become a senior registrar and go into the sub speciality of uh, clinical pharmacology right and like most sub specialties in uh, medicine after finishing md medicine uh, the training in clinical pharmacology is also 3 years right uh, the first year uh, being local training where you will work as a senior registrar in uh, in the in the discipline you come from um and i must tell you at this point uh, you can enter clinical pharmacology also by uh, completing uh, md pediatrics also so it will be post md pediatrics as a sub speciality uh, so uh, for the first year will be spent uh, mostly in the primary discipline that you came from if it is from medicine you will be working as a senior registrar in medicine if it is uh, from pediatrics you will be working in a unit as a senior registrar in pediatrics um then in the second year you go into these rotations or um, go into these uh, short appointments where you do uh, i will highlight to you for, uh, uh, in the next slides uh, and then in the third and fourth uh, third year is the uh, compulsory overseas training but of course if you want you can spend an additional year as the fourth year in overseas training so the local training involves uh, rotations as i will highlight to you not only in the traditional disciplines but also in areas like uh, working in a clinical trials unit pharmacogenomics and regulatory uh, the first year also involves in, in, in uh, involvement in teaching and relevant research um, and it is a good balance for, especially for someone who is in academia these are the clinical rotations and you can see um the local training uh, in uh, other than your primary discipline also involves medical sub specialties but also the specific units that are in, uh, relevant to regulation of medicines like, like the national medicines regulatory authority a uh, quality assurance laboratory uh, the ministry involved in procurement uh, pharmacogenomics like and, and toxicology like other units that are relevant to safe effective uh, and cost uh, economic use of medicines um in humans once you do that uh, you go for foreign training uh, and uh, as clinical pharmacology is a recognized discipline in other countries especially in the uk um, there are jobs available for you um, where you can go and work as a, uh, uh, a senior level registrar uh, in uh, one of the nhs trust i worked in uh, uh, in edinburgh um attached to nhs lothian the trust uh, the pictures that are shown here and i was there for a two years time period so uh, since uh, and clinics in, and there are a lot of clinical pharmacology trainees in these countries 
and it is not very difficult to find these jobs. There are specialized clinical pharmacology uh, training centers uh, in and around UK and you can find the job in these places. Training in the UK, uh, for me, I mean, uh, involved uh, clinical training in acute and general medicine and also do working in clinical trials unit, regulatory pharmacology um, in, in the UK and involvement in health technology assessment um, and also working in a specialized toxicology unit and pharmacogenomics. So uh, once you get to this stage, it is up to you to select uh, what are the super specialty or super, uh, finer areas that you go into. So once you get both certified um, and come back to Sri Lanka, um, there are positions, uh, there will be positions available for you in the Ministry of Health if you are a part of that. I, of course, had been in the University of Colombo for the past 12 years. So when I returned, uh, my job was uh, available in the University of Colombo. Uh, you can also work uh, in drug development and work with the industry and also work with the Ministry in regulatory processes um, when you come back and work in Sri Lanka. The clinical pharmacology discipline uh, acts as a bridge uh, between traditional pharmacologists and clinicians and uh, is a sort of a harmonization between these two. But the, in Sri Lanka, the discipline needs to evolve further. Um, and in, in other countries, you will see that people who do clinical pharmacology uh, have dual certification. They are also both certified in medicine in addition to clinical pharmacology, in pediatrics in addition to clinical pharmacology. Uh, so that is something that Sri Lanka needs to explore as well. At the moment, that is not possible in the Sri Lankan situation. But I must tell you, if you are interested in a, striking a balance between clinical work, research and uh, academia or teaching, uh, this is a, a good specialty that you could consider. So with that, uh, I would like to end my session. I wish all of you all the very best in whatever the chosen disciplines that you go into. Thank you very much.